This podcast episode was made possible in part with support from Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation-funded project hosted by Northeastern University that promotes public scholarship on religion. I highly recommend you learn more about Sacred Rights on their website, sacred-rights.org, that's W-R-I-T-E-S, or find Sacred Rights on Twitter at sacred underscore rights. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. The power of travel in transforming our connections and appreciations for the places and landscapes of the world is a recurring theme of this show. Certain places were pivotal pieces of earth in helping me shape my worldviews and motivations, and hearing those same stories from other interesting people makes me very happy. Today's topic of conversation involves Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism, a 15th century Buddhist teacher named Garampa Sonam Senge, and the power of public scholarship when talking about people and traditions from centuries past. My guest is Dr. Constance Kasser. Dr. Kasser is an assistant professor of religious studies at Lawrence University, where she teaches courses on Buddhist thought and Asian religious traditions. Her research focuses on Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, and she is currently involved in several projects related to Garampa Sonam Senge. She is also interested in religion and comics, women and gender minorities in Buddhism, pedagogy, and digital humanities. In fact, Dr. Kasser also has an Audible original series titled Religious Lessons from Asia to the World, which you can find in the Audible app and store. You can find Dr. Kasser on Twitter, at Constance Kasser, You can find this show on Twitter at Classical underscore Ideas. And without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Constance Kasser. Dr. Constance Kasser, welcome to Classical Ideas. Thanks for having me. It's a delight to have you. Uh, I'm wondering if we can start off just a little bit by having you introduce yourself to the audience, however you see fit, so they can know who you are and what you do. I am a, an assistant professor of religious studies at Lawrence University in Wisconsin. And my, my official job title is professor of Asian religions, but um, Asia, Asia is a pretty big place. So yeah. <laughs> my, 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 my general ex- area of expertise is Buddhism and Hinduism. I focus mostly on South Asia and the Himalayas, so Nepal, Tibet, that, that general region of the world. Oh, fantastic. Um, that is really great. So there's another person in the sacred rights cohort who's also a Himalayan scholar, which is a really interesting parallel. Maybe we can talk about that in a few minutes. But so let's um, talk a little bit about how you got onto your path that, you, that you're currently on. I'm always curious about people's backstories and what led them there. And, you know, how somebody gets interested in Tibetan Buddhist philosophy is, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, an interesting life path to follow for somebody <laughs> from like the middle of the United States. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I want to know about like some stepping stones that led you down your path that you've traveled until today that you consider to be essential turning points. Like it can be moments from youth or undergrad or grad school or important people, anything that you see as essential in uh, helping you find what it is that you do today. Sure. Um, I, I think that my story that I like to tell is really a, a kind of a plug for, for the liberal arts and the mm. importance of a, of a liberal arts education. Um, when I was in all through elementary school, through high school, I was really into math and science. And I had this plan that I was going to go to college and I was going to become a biomedical engineer. And I was going to develop drugs for you know curing curing all sorts of oh um, fascinating um and and that was my plan and i and i went to college i went to smith college which is a um a small women's liberal arts school in massachusetts and 
I was taking biology classes and they were fine. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I started taking philosophy classes Mm. and I was really excited by my philosophy classes. And I took this one class on skepticism with Jay Garfield, who is a scholar of Western philosophy and Buddhist philosophy. And we were learning about Greek skepticism. And then we read David Hume and all this Western philosophy. And towards the end of the semester, uh, Jay Garfield said, oh, we're also going to read a little bit by this seventh century Indian guy named Chandrakirti. Wonderful. And I read that and I was just totally hooked. And I was really excited about this. I had no idea that philosophy was done outside of the the European um, sort of context. Mm. And about a semester or two later, there was a Tibetan monk. Um, his name is, is Tashi Tsering. And, and he was visiting from this school in India, the Central University for Tibetan Studies. And he was going to teach a class on Buddhist thought. And I knew nothing about Buddhism aside from this week or so that I had studied Chandrakirti in the skepticism class. And I had space in my schedule. And I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool. Learn about Buddhism from a Buddhist monk. Like when, (laughs) when am I ever going to do that again in my whole life? Yeah. Um, And so I took the class and it, it just, um, I don't know, a light bulb went off for me and I got really, really excited about Buddhist philosophy. And later that year, um, Jay Garfield was, was taking a group of students to study in India for three or four weeks during the break in between the fall and spring semesters. And he was going to take students, he does this every year, to this university in India where this monk had come from. And so I signed up for that. I went, um, I was just totally amazed by Buddhist philosophy and totally amazed by just being in India. Um, and I decided that was that was what I wanted to do and that I really wasn't that, ex- I wasn't as excited about my path in biology as I was about all these other big ideas. And so came back from India and changed my major and um, yeah, went and hung out in India for a while after undergrad and applied to graduate school from India, which in the, in the early two thousands was kind of a feat because oh my gosh, internet was hard to come by in a lot of the places where I was. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And that, that's really what kind of set me on my, on my trajectory. I'm wondering if like, while you were still involved in the sciences and you started being more involved in philosophy, if the philosophy started to overlay how you saw the science, you know what I mean? Like the way that, um, whenever a scientist incorporates elements of like philosophy or moral philosophy, I feel like it, it, it changes the way they see the scientific work. Did you have any experiences like that at all? To be honest, as an, as an undergrad, no. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, as yeah, an undergrad, I was yeah. just like, oh, the, these, these biology classes are just more of a pain that I feel like I have to yeah. get through. <laughs> but later on, when I was in graduate school, I did my PhD at Emory University. And Emory has developed this really amazing program uh, connecting Tibetan Buddhist scholars and scientists. Mm-hmm. And they have this whole exchange program where scientists from Emory go to India and teach these intensive courses on science to um, Buddhist monastics. And at the same time, a handful, a very small handful of Buddhist monastics have come to Emory to do intensive college level studies in science so that they can take that knowledge and take it back to their monasteries. Um, The Dalai Lama is really, really big on uh, pushing, pushing, science, Western science, um, in the monastic curriculum. That is absolutely wonderful. All right. So, um, that's such a a rich backstory. You know, those, uh, I'm curious about your, your years abroad too. Um, but you know, before we get into a little bit more specifically about your work, let's talk a little bit about sacred rites, what you're currently involved in. And so all these experiences that you had, you know, like finding your way in the world, moving from the sciences to the to philosophy and then going around the world and becoming interested in the scholarly path that you're currently on. 
Now this finds you a member of the current 2020 Sacred Rights cohort um, out of Northeastern University, which is fantastic. And I love what they do so much because it takes people who are interested in topics like you're interested in and that it uh, helps you to, you know, distill it out into the wider world for the for a wider audience, Mm -hmm. which is what I'm all about here. And, you know, I'm curious about uh, why you applied to this fellowship and what sorts of skills you feel you are adding to your scholarship toolbox, if you will. Like, what is this experience doing for you? Yeah, this experience has been so fantastic. I, I am so grateful that I've had the opportunity to participate in this program. I think for me, being a product of a liberal arts undergraduate education, and also teaching at a liberal arts school now at, at Lawrence, there's a lot of focus on being able to talk to people outside of my discipline. Mm. Uh, at Lawrence, I'm, I'm the person who teaches all the religions in all of Asia. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't have people on my university campus who I can geek out about 15th century Tibetan Buddhist philosophy with. Right. Um, so I have to be able to talk about my work in ways that people who are non-specialists can understand. And I think that's been one of the most important things that I've learned from the Sacred Rights Program is just getting more tools to talk to people and not Mm -hmm. just other scholars, but talk to other people who might just be interested um, in the stuff that I do. Because I mean, I think the stuff that I do is really interesting. And I, I get excited when when other people get excited about it, too, and we can have conversations about it. Definitely. Well, like I'm thinking about ways that I would utilize you as like a, a, a teaching collaborator, essentially, like say you and I lived in the same town. Right. And I was a high school teacher teaching a course about religious studies in like a public high school. I would 100% be interested in having somebody with your areas of interest and expertise come in and talk to my students about what you do and, you know, traveling around the world and, you know, you know, learning about other cultures and practices. And that's one of my favorite things as a high school teacher is to have guests come in the room and to talk about those experiences. Like we've had a Tibetan Buddhist monk from Namgyal Monastery come to my classroom in the past. And the students just love those experiences because, you know, gets them outside of like their like Missouri, uh, like youth, you know what I mean? And to see how huge the world is and how, how huge experiences can be. So I love that you're, you know, doing that and seeking those opportunities. Have you ever like talked to like high school kids at all? I, you know, I haven't talked with high school kids in any kind of formal way, but I, I did just last week, um, a, a friend of mine from graduate school who is a pastor, she invited me to her, um, her Bible study group awesome. and, and they were, they were talking about Ecclesiastes. And so I met with this Bible study group, you know, we sat around on zoom and drank coffee together and, um, we talked about karma and, And it was so much fun. And I love having those kinds of opportunities. Um, I'm going to be teaching some some courses on Buddhist history for a group of um, yoga teachers and practitioners based in New York City uh, later this month. Um, So I I love having those kinds of opportunities. I've never done it with with high school students, but I think that could be really, really fun. Absolutely. They're so fun and they're so curious. And basically, like, I would just say to my students, okay, you have a guest speaker coming in. Everybody write down five questions under this live Google Doc. And then we go through and we sort them together. And then when the person comes in, they all have this massive list of like 100 questions that they could ask. So I just basically turn the whole thing into like a White House press press room sort of <laughs> briefing or the person comes in and says, hi, I'm so-and-so. And then the hands just shoot up and it's like, yes, you. So like my guests like never prepare anything when they come to the classroom, they just walk in the room and just start getting questions thrown at them. And, awesome. and then it goes for like an hour or an hour and a half sometimes. And it's just super fun. But anyway, <laughs> um, so you spent years living in Nepal and India. What years were those? Oh, I, I, I have been, uh, I mean, since, since 2003, 2003 was my first trip to India when I went as an undergrad on this, this just short program. Um, and then I've really, I've been spending time 
um, you know, if, if not counting the pandemic because we can't go anywhere, but, right. um, you know, if we don't count the pandemic, I've, I've been spending, you know, at least, a at least six, six weeks to several months at a time, sometimes longer, um, every year oh, in, goodness. in India and, and increasingly in Nepal now. So the, the longest stretches of time were, I spent a year in India studying at the Central University for Tibetan Studies, which is in Sarnath um, in Northern India in 2005, 2006. Um, and then I also, when I was in grad school, I spent a year in um, Bodhanath, which is just outside of Kathmandu in Nepal uh, in 2010 to 2011, I had a Fulbright fellowship. Um, but I, I, I go back either with students or to do research or just to hang out and see friends uh, at, at least at least once a year, pretty much. Tell me about the the past year of not being able to do that. Like what's what's missing in your life this year? Oh, I just, <laughs> I miss my friends. Yeah. <laughs> I, miss my, I miss my collaborators. Actually, this year, this year has been particularly tough because this year, I'm actually on sabbatical for the whole year. I was mm. awarded a, a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities that was supposed to support me spending a year in Nepal working on a translation of this massive 15th century text. And I was supposed to be collaborating with Kempo Ngawang Jordan, who is a, a scholar who's based in Nepal. And we just, we haven't been able to work in the ways that we had anticipated working. And so um, it's, it's, it's rough this year in particular. Yeah, that is a, that's a real tragedy actually. Um, mm -hmm. Well, okay. So <clears throat> you've spent a lot of time out of the country as well. And I did that as well. Like after undergrad, I moved around the world for like five years and my experiences were totally different than yours. But you know, I can't speak highly enough to the essentialness of those years of my life. And I'm, I'm curious if you can just say, like, what those experiences of going out of the country um, did for you as far as like, you know, living a rich and fulfilling life. Oh, I, I think that the time that I have spent in other countries, and particularly in India and Nepal, has just I mean, it sounds almost cliche to say it, but, you know, broaden my perspective mm -hmm. on the world. Um, you know, it's made me appreciate a lot of a lot of things that that we have in the United States um, that are just not readily available. I mean, when I was living in Nepal, the situation has changed a little bit now. But when I was there in 2010, 2011, uh, in the winter, because most of Kathmandu's electricity is based on hydropower, and the winter is the dry season where mm. there's no rain for months at a time. There's not enough electricity or there wasn't back then enough electricity to be able to provide electricity 24 hours a day to everybody in the entire Kathmandu Valley. Yeah. And so we would have these scheduled uh, rolling blackouts. They called it load shedding. Mm -hmm. And it would be published in the paper every few weeks or every month. And the, the schedule would change every few weeks. And, and you'd look in the newspaper and you could see when you would have power and when your power would be cut based on which neighborhood you lived in. Um, and you'd have to plan. And, you know, you'd, you'd have to plan to, you know, make sure that I'd have to make sure that my laptop was charged up so that I could do research after the power went out. I'd have to, um, you know, the 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 way the water worked, you'd have to make sure that the water pumps were on so that you would have running water after the power went out. Um, you know, and so those sorts of things, you know, and then in the United States, we don't, we don't think about that stuff right. unless there's some kind of disaster, right? Like what we just saw in, in Texas. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so, so just that aspect of things really gave me an appreciation for, for a lot of things. But beyond that, I think just learning how to communicate with people in different ways, mm -hmm. um, especially traveling to parts of India or parts of Nepal where I didn't speak the, the local language in the area. And so I wouldn't be able to communicate as readily with people and just learning how to, how to be creative um, in finding ways to communicate. Cause you can always find ways to communicate, which sure. is something that's really fascinating. 
You know, you bring up language, and I find that to be a really interesting question that we should talk about for a second. So, you know, being somebody who is an academic who studies parts of the world where you're not like a native speaker of the language, uh, tell me about your language development and pursuits that you've taken to, you know, improve your communication and also because it relates to doing translation work. So I'd imagine that you have to do some really intense language trainings and studies, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, a lot of my graduate program was just focused on learning languages. That was, that was a huge part of my, my graduate training. And so learning Sanskrit, um, learning classical Tibetan and spoken Tibetan, which are essentially two different languages. Mm. Um, so classical Tibetan is, is the, the medium of the, the, the text that I'm translating, the texts that I read, but spoken Tibetan is totally different. And so a lot of my training has really just come from spending time abroad, spending time reading texts with people, spending time talking with people. Uh, when, I, when I went to Nepal for, for my Fulbright year, I, I went to the monastery where I was going to uh, do, my, do my research for the year. And I sat down with the abbot of the monastery and he said, okay, so I'm going to find some monks for you to meet with, to study this text. And he said, he asked, how's your, how's your spoken Tibetan? And I said, nah, it's, it's not great. You know, it, it could be better. <laughs> and he just got a smile on his face and he said, okay, come, come back tomorrow and I'll introduce you to the monks who you're going to read with. And he paired me with these two monks who are phenomenal scholars and speak very, very little English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was so nervous at first because I was like, how am I going to talk about this text in spoken Tibetan, um, you know, with these, with these people who can barely speak English and my spoken Tibetan is not very good. But it was one of the greatest things that um, that that could have happened to me because it really forced me to get clear on how to ask questions and full immersion. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. How how's your come? How's your your spoken versus your written today? My 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 colloquial Tibetan is not as good as my classical Tibetan. Um, <laughs> it's something that I'm I'm always actively trying to work on, but. You know, to be honest, languages have always been really hard for me, and it's it's something that I've always really struggled with. And I'm I'm jealous of folks who can, uh, you know, hear a language and hear something once and they they pick it up. My my graduate advisor John Dunn, he was he was like that, you know, and he he he's great with languages and was always really frustrating. <laughs> yeah, the thing the thing that frustrates me about learning new languages is I think about all the amazing books out there that I haven't ever read that are, you know, easily available in English and, you know, I can read them like right now and I'm like, okay, so I can spend time learning another language or I can read this work that I've never read yet. So like I find myself gravitating towards reading a book that I've never read before as opposed to learning like a new language like at a kindergarten level. Do you know what I mean? So like I'm like I want to ingest this classical work instead of practicing like kindergarten or preschool level French. So that's what's been like the thing that's kept me from practicing new languages is all the things that I haven't been exposed to yet in English that I want to experience within my lifetime. And it's like, oh my gosh, the opportunity cost. Like I go back and forth. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and this is, this is part of why, you know, the, the research that I'm doing right now and the work that I'm doing right now involves translating this, this text that I think is a really important text and it hasn't been made available in English yet. And mm -hmm. um, I feel like in a certain way, part of, part of my duty as a scholar who, knows classical Tibetan, who's, who's capable of reading and, and understanding these sorts of texts. I want to make them available to people who are like you, who want to learn new stuff and want to be exposed to new stuff, but who don't necessarily want to spend a decade of their life learning a new language. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into your work. You know, I find conversations about Tibet to be so intriguing. Um, I've had 
a conversation on the show uh, discussing the life of Mingir Peldrim with Dr. Allison Melnick Dyer, a fellow Sacred Rites past cohort member, mm -hmm. but also uh, Namgyal Monastery with a Tibetan monk, like I mentioned earlier. Um, I've also talked about Tibetan Buddhist vegetarianism and the life of Jigme Limpo with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Barstow. And you're currently working on a book about the 15th century teacher Garampa Sonam Senge who lived between 1429 and 1489. Did I say that name correctly? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, as we discuss these questions, um, I want you to think about it like you're standing in front of like my high school classroom talking to my students. Mm -hmm. um, like, so imagine that your audience is like 18 year olds. Who is Garampa Sonam Senge? And how did you first come to be exposed to this person's existence? Mm. Um, so... Gorampa was a, a, a monk, a scholar, um, and he was part of a minority sect of Tibetan Buddhism. So, you know, when we think about Buddhism, there are different sects, there are different traditions, different lineages. And within Tibetan Buddhism, there are also different sects. So mm -hmm. I like to compare it to, you know, you can think about Protestant Christianity. Um, and within Protestant Christianity, there's, you know, there are Lutherans and there are Presbyterians and, yeah. there are, and, you know, if you, if you look at there's, there's Christianity as a whole, and then there's Catholicism, there's Protestantism. And, you know, the more you narrow your focus, the more kind of subtle these distinctions are, mm. um, but they're different, slightly different beliefs, different um, lineages in terms of, you know, how these different traditions were formed, different practices, um, so within Tibetan Buddhism, we can kind of think about it like that. Perfect. So, um, the, the biggest sect within Tibetan Buddhism is called the Geluk sect. And this is the sect that the Dalai Lama belongs to. Um, but then there are other, generally speaking, we say there are four main sects of Tibetan Buddhism. So the Geluk sect is the biggest one. Um, the sect that Gorampa was a part of is called the Sakya sect, um, which is one of the smallest sects of Tibetan Buddhism. And Gorampa wrote some things that were really critical of the Geluk sect. Um, he wrote a lot of philosophical texts. He was this really prolific author. But so part of what I think is really interesting about Gorampa is that he's using philosophy to make these attacks against um, against the dominant sect. Mm. And what wound up happening is later on, um, the, the Geluk sect, as it started growing in power, and this is all wrapped up in politics and, and power and control. And, um, you know, so it, it, religion kind of tends to get involved in other aspects of society. Mm -hmm. But as the Geluk sect starts growing, um, in the 17th century, the fifth Dalai Lama, who was this very powerful political figure, he didn't want anything out there circulating in Tibet that was critical of this sect because he wanted there to be power and control. And so he actually went around, he sent people out and a lot of monasteries were forcibly converted from their sect to the, the Geluk sect. And a lot of writings that were critical of the Geluk sect were either destroyed or suppressed in other ways um, or kind of hidden away somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so Gorampa's writings, because they were so critical of this particular sect, um, his stuff in the 17th century was all banned within central Tibet where the central Tibetan government was. And it was really only studied kind of in the far reaches of Eastern Tibet, kind of out in the, the frontier sort of area where the, where the government didn't necessarily have as much control. Mm. Um, so so Gorampa is this, this really interesting figure because he's this skillful philosopher, uh, but he's also, um, he, he was for, for centuries considered this very controversial sort of figure. Is it kind of a miracle that his writings survived throughout these years of suppression? Like what kind of written texts are we, are we looking at here? Yeah. So he, um, the, around the, the beginning of the 20th century, there was this monk named Jamgyal Rinpoche who um, asked 
permission from the 13th Dalai Lama. Um, the, 13th, the, the current Dalai Lama who we have is the 14th. So the, the previous Dalai Lama before him. And he said, um, he basically asked for permission to go and search for and, and collect whatever he could find of Gorampa's writings. And at this point, the Gelug sect was firmly established as the dominant sect. There was no threat of these tiny minority sects, um, mm -hmm. you know, taking over at this point. So the 13th Dalai Lama said, yeah, sure. And so Jamgyal Rinpoche went around to monasteries in, in Eastern Tibet and he collected whatever he could find from these monasteries that had survived. And he found um, 13 volumes worth of texts. So, so not, not 13 texts, but 13 volumes mm, worth of texts. So a lot of, of writing. And we have reason to believe that there are some writings that didn't necessarily survive. Mm -hmm. um, but what we have is 13 volumes worth of stuff. Um, so he was a really prolific author. Fabulous. Well, you mentioned that he was critical of the Gay Lug sect. What is his? What is he most well known for, as far as like fiery critique? Um, he his his favorite philosophical opponent was um, Tsongkhapa, who was the founder of the Gay Lug sect. And Tsongkhapa lived at the end of the thirteenth or end of the fourteenth, beginning of the fifteenth century. So he actually died ten years before Gorampa was born. So in the grand scheme of things, they were rough contemporaries, but they didn't live at the same time. Um, but Gorampa just the, you know, if you, if you imagine a monk in 15th century <laughs> Tibet, just writing these, you know, philosophical critiques, um, the, the way that he kind of takes these jabs at Tsongkhapa are, are just really, um, skillful and very tongue in cheek. Mm. And, um, you know, he, he says things like there's, there's a famous story of Tsongkhapa having a, a vision of Manjushri, who's this, this Bodhisattva, this enlightened being. Um, and this is, this is well known in Tsongkhapa's biography. And Gorapa just very casually says, you know, maybe it wasn't Manjushri who visited Tsongkhapa. Maybe it was actually a demon in disguise, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, which in the context of thinking about monks writing about these things, like that's actually a really harsh criticism. Um, so, so he has a lot of those sorts of things sprinkled throughout his work, which is why I, th I think it's fun. It's fun to read him. So there's humor involved as well. It sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. There's some, some sarcasm. Yeah. I love that. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'd imagine that for you as a translator, finding those moments of humor and sarcasm must be kind of a thrill, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's great. I mean, you know, sometimes I'll be sitting alone reading by myself, working on translating, and I'll just be like, oh, no! <laughs> Burn! <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, can you pinpoint the moment when your interest in Garampa deepened so much that you're like, yes, this is my focus for the next several years of my life. Like what, what, tell me about that, that, like that moment of epiphany where you're like, I have to do this. Yeah. Um, this, this happened sometime between 2005 and 2006 when I was studying in India after I'd graduated from college. And when I was in college, um, I've mentioned Jay Garfield before. He's he's a pretty well-known scholar of uh, Buddhist philosophy. And he has translated things by important Buddhist thinkers, including Tsongkhapa. And so I remember in college, when I was first starting to learn Tibetan and I was working very closely with Jay, and um, he was in the process of finishing this translation of this philosophical work by Tsongkhapa. And so... I felt like I, I had a pretty good handle on Tsongkhapa, but at the time I didn't realize that there were these sectarian debates mm. that were happening. And so I just kind of had this naive understanding of, well, this is what Tibetan Buddhists think about X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And then I went to India and I started studying closely with this monk who I had first met when I was in college, Tashi Tsering. And he happens to be a scholar from the Sakya tradition. Mm. 
And so he's the one who introduced me to Gorampa and he said, well, why don't we, why don't we read some, some stuff by Gorampa? And we're sitting down and we're reading through this text and I'm like, well, that's not what Tsongkhapa says. Mm. And I remember my teacher just kind of laughing and he said, no, of course, that's not what Tsongkhapa says. And that was the moment when I, I realized, oh, there are actually these really intense debates happening within um, Tibetan Buddhism. And I remember just really finding Gorampa's way of arguing and the arguments that he was making really convincing. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And I remember sending an email to, to Jay. Um, I had to go and go into town and find an internet cafe at the time. But um, I, I went and sent an email to Jay. And I was like, did you know that these debates were happening? You know, and he was like, I'm glad, I'm glad you're learning that. You know? Yeah. But that was that was really what um, what got me excited about it. Wonderful. Well, I'm curious about the the rediscovery of of Garampa. Like, so you mentioned that he that he was suppressed until the early 20th century, and I'm wondering if you can you know talk about this this reemergence of his work into you know a public awareness. Like, tell me about this uh, this digging him up essentially in the early 20th century. Yeah. So so when his works were recovered. This was probably around 1920, in mm -hmm. the early 1920s. And so this monk, Jamgyal Rinpoche, recovered these 13 volumes worth of texts, and he had them reprinted at this massive publishing house um, that um, used to be very active in Tibet, called, um, in this place called Derge. And these these texts they were they were all all thirteen volumes worth were carved onto wood blocks mm. by hand, um, so you can imagine how how much time and, and effort that took. But once they were all carved onto the wood blocks, they were able to be mass produced, and then they were recirculated around Tibet. And one of the things that we see with this kind of reemergence resurgence of of Gorampa's philosophy being out there in, in Tibetan scholastic circles is that philosophers from other sects, especially these other minority non-Gelug sects, start reading his philosophy. Um, and they recognize that his philosophical ideas are compatible with a lot of their meditative practices and, and a lot of the things that are emphasized in some of these other schools. And so what ends up happening is that Gorampa's philosophy, because Gorampa was such a skilled philosopher and he was able to argue in, in such pointed ways against the Gaelic tradition, or at least against the, the early Gaelic tradition, as Tsongkhapa articulated it, um, these other monasteries start either bringing in scholars who are experts in Gorampa from the Sakya tradition to teach their monks, um, or, or they, you know, start studying and, 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 and learning it themselves within their monasteries. Um, and even in the Gaelic tradition, now there's this renewed interest in Gorampa because, you know, it's, it's good to know who you're arguing against, right? right. You know, know, know your enemy, so to speak. Not that these sects are enemies, but, um, you know, to, to, get more skilled at, at the philosophy, um, it's important to know what other people are saying about you. Has the tension between the Gelugs and the Sakya sects, has that reduced with time as, you know, um, as centuries pass? I mean, I would imagine that the, that things people used to argue about become a little less important. Has that taken place between these two sects at all? I think, um, you know, there, there's, especially, after the 1950s and the the Chinese occupation of Tibet, um, you know, there there there's not much at stake politically um, in terms of which monastery has control and you know um, who's who's the most important monastery in this particular region. Um, and with with Tibetan monasteries being reestablished in exile in places in India and Nepal and other places around the world, you have um, something that, that we didn't see in Tibet where you have a Gelug monastery right down the street from a Sakya monastery mm. and a Kagi monastery around the corner. And that's not something that you had in Tibet in the past because it was, you know, in this area, in this village, there's one monastery and it's affiliated with one tradition. And 
you know, you'd have to travel a day or two to get to a monastery that was affiliated with another tradition. Right. Um, so there's a lot more um, conversation, I think. There are a lot more, there, there are many more instances of, of monastics who talking to each other, um, you know, across sectarian divides. So I think in that sense, they're not, um, there's, there's not as much at stake um, on a kind of political sort of worldly level. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if you talk to some of the philosophers, Buddhist philosophers, especially Tibetan Buddhist philosophers can still get pretty, pretty worked yeah. up and heated about uh, philosophical ideas. I love it. I'm curious of who is most um, inspired by Garampa today. Does he have any like particular schools or institutions that are like most heavily inspired by his writings in particular and who see him as sort of like a central figure that is like the foundation of what they teach? So in the, the Sakya tradition, which is where he, he came from, I mean, the Sakya tradition still to, to this day really regards Garampa as the, the mainstream. He's, he's like kind of the, the ideal, you know, not to not to mix too many philosophical metaphors here, but he's like the platonic form of, you know, the the Sakya philosopher. Um, there were other important Sakya philosophers who had slightly different ideas who have kind of been pushed to the sidelines for various uh, different kinds of reasons. But Gurampa is still among the Sakya tradition. He's upheld as as one of the really the most important philosophers. But there's not much of his work that has been translated into English as of yet, um, which is why I'm, I'm working on trying to translate his stuff right now, because I think he's really important. Fabulous. How's, how is your translation project coming? Like what, what uh, stage in the process are you? Well, so I, I've had to rework all of that because of the pandemic this yeah. year. So right now, what I'm working on is just getting... Uh, I, I have a draft of this text and this text, um, just to give you a sense of how, how massive it is. Um, this text is about 400 pages long, okay. a little more than 400 pages long. And it's this encyclopedic text. Um, and Gurampa brings in Indian philosophers and um, Tibetan philosophers and Buddhist philosophers, non-Buddhist philosophers, and he'll he'll say, okay, here's an important point in our philosophical system. And here's what all these non-Buddhists say. Here's what these Indian Buddhists say. Here's what different Tibetan Buddhists say. Here's who's right. Here's who's wrong. Here's what I think about it. Um, so it's this really, really detailed, um, comprehensive sort of overview. Um, and one of the things that's really annoying about Tibetan texts is Tibetan monks don't, they, they never cited their sources, mm. you know? So he would just say, well, according to some people, and then he'd have a direct quote. And it's like, uh, I don't know where that comes from. Yeah. Um, but the audience that he was writing for at the time, was a group of monastics who, for, for whom memorizing long um, texts was part of their curriculum. So a lot of times he can just say something and you know, quote a couple of lines of verse, and a monk reading it would say, "Oh, that's from, you know, chapter six, verse twenty-three of Chandrakirti's Madhyamagavatara." Um, you know, and like, so so that's that's hard for me to know. So right now, where I'm at with the text is, I've got a draft of the of all four hundred pages, mm -hmm. um, and what I'm working on now is trying to track down those sources. Yeah. Um, so, so, and, and that's, that's part of why I'm relying on um, Scott, Tibetan scholars for, for help with this translation. So not only to ensure that my translation's accurate, but also because they can just recall a lot of these um, citations that I don't know. Those are going to be some absolutely epic footnotes, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, okay. So one of my favorite things in, you know, writing from scholars such as yourself is when they take writings, which are centuries old, and they overlay it with examples from today to create something modern um, in a way that it's digestible for people living here and now in whatever society they're in to, to comprehend and to internalize and to think about. And you have some, some great workout on patience 
from my friends over at Lions Roar. I know a few people over there. Mm-hmm. Um, in the aftermath of like this weird year that we've been living through, like this U.S. election and like the pandemic and the challenges that we're all that we've all been, you know, living in in front of our very eyes for the past like twelve months, but. You know, you have a piece that I read the other day that I really enjoy called Patience Isn't Passive and examines and discusses the work of Shanti Deva and overlays the challenges we face today. So let's shift gears a little bit from Garampa over to some of your other stuff that you've been doing. Um, So I'm curious if you can talk a little bit about who Shanti Deva is because this person seems to be important in your thinking as well. Yeah. So yeah, Shanti Deva lived in the eighth century in India, and he was a monk. He studied at Nalanda University, which was a famous um, Buddhist monastic university, and he is known primarily for writing this text called the Bodhicharya Avatara, the the Way of the Bodhisattva. Um, so a Bodhisattva is is um, someone who's who's on the Buddhist path to awakening. Mm. So he wrote this text that's kind of considered a sort of manual for how to live a good life. And um, this is this text in particular is is one of the most revered, cherished, well known, widely studied text um, across many many different Buddhist traditions, um, and particularly in Tibetan Buddhism. So. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of a little bit of who Shanti Deva is. I'll leave that there. What, what, why is the text, uh, the way of the Bodhisattva important to, to you personally, like within your work? What I, what I really love about this text is every time I read it, every time I teach it, I find something new. Mm. In it. It's essentially a long poem. Um, and it's, it's, it's divided up into different chapters um, that talk about different um, good qualities that a person should cultivate if they're on the Buddhist path. So generosity, discipline, patience, wisdom, um, all of these different, different good qualities. But every time I pick up the text, every time I look at it, it, it can be a passage that I've read, you know, 50 times before. Yeah. And especially when I teach it in class, I, I love teaching this text because students always have a different take on, on things. And I'll walk into class expecting that uh, I'm like, oh, I know exactly what the students are going to ask about. I know yeah. what they're going to be confused about. And somebody will chime in with some completely new interpretation that just blows me away. You know, that happens with me a lot as well whenever I teach works like that. So I'm thinking about like whenever I've taught like the Tao Te Ching or the Analects mm-hmm. of Confucius or the Bhagavad Gita. And like, you know, over years of teaching texts like this, you start to see patterns in what students ask about. And then somebody will come in and will read like the opening chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. And a student will be like sitting over in the corner and they'll raise their hand and be like, you know, I just en- enlisted in the military last week and this is really blowing my mind right now. You know, those those personal experiences within people's lives is kind of what makes these texts so timeless because you can inject your own life story over the top of them and completely change the way that you see about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I actually had a similar experience the last time I taught the, the Bodhicharya Avatara. I had a student who raised his hand and he was like, I'm in the military and when the term ends, I'm, or he was in the Marines, I think. And, and he said, as soon as this term's over, I'm getting shipped out to Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, and it was just, it was, it was so eye opening to hear his take on this text, just knowing what was going on in the back of his mind and how he could make that relevant to his life. Mm, I love it. Well, this patience um, isn't passive article talks about you know, patience with people amidst like the maelstrom that seems to continue unabated around us in the year 2020 and 2021. Like, I feel like we're still living in this state of uh, chaos at the beginning of March, 2021. And like, we have this like big picture and structural problems in our society that become more glaring to me with each passing day. And I'm curious if you can talk to me a little bit about Shanti Deva pain and reacting with patience in in this time like what like kind of like what inspired you to write this piece yeah well i think what what really inspired me to write 
that piece in particular in the aftermath of the, the last presidential election was, you know, there, there's a lot of anger um, among people, regardless of who folks voted for. You yeah. know, there, there was a lot of anger um, in, in the United States and still is yep. um, in a lot of ways. And there's this kind of, there's this misconception that a lot of people have about Buddhism that, you know, well, if you're, if you're a Buddhist, you just have to, you know, um, just, just peacefully sit and, and meditate and disengage from the world. And, and I think that's actually not what Buddhism is at all. Buddhism, especially the way that Shantideva talks about it, it demands this kind of radical, active engagement with the world. And so part of what I was doing with, with that piece was really trying to get folks to understand that when Shanti Deva talks about this idea of patience, it's not like you should just sit there and not get angry ever and just ignore everything that's going on around you. Mm. I think the way that Shanti Deva talks about patience is actually to, to, to be patient when you're confronted with a harm or a, a painful situation in the sense that instead of reacting blindly to it, um, if you can exhibit just, just a little bit of patience in order to take a step back from your situation, understand what is it that's causing you to be angry and try to get some sense of, okay, how can I respond to this in a skillful way? rather than just reacting with blind rage and mm -hmm. ranting at people on Facebook or something. <laughs> yeah. Know, which, that, that's really easy to do, you know, when you get angry and then just yell at somebody on Facebook. But it's it's much harder and it takes much more effort and and skill to be able to take a step back and to think, okay, what are what are the broader structures that are that are at play here? And how can I work skillfully to prevent something like, you know, something that's causing pain and anger from happening in the future? Or yeah. who can I work with? Who can I pair up with? You know, or what communities can I get involved in to, to work on changing things? Yeah, recognizing the pain that seems so widespread right now seems crucial. And like that reminds me of another article of yours, um, where you write that genuine compassion is uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you can, like, how do you see yourself struggling or succeeding with your own compassion in this most difficult of years? Where are you in all this? Oh, that's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the piece I think that you're referring to is a piece I wrote a couple of years ago for, for tricycle. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. And, uh, that one I, I like because this is another another one of these things that that Gorampa has written that really just kind of makes me pause. Um, and he says, you know, if, if you really have compassion, it feels as though you are a parent of an only child and you've seen your only child fall into a pit of fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you can imagine what that would feel like, um, you know, that complete just overwhelming sense of, I need to do whatever I can right now to, to help this person. This person is suffering. Um, and, and Gorampa says, you know, genuine compassion actually feels like that, kind of recognizing that everyone around us is suffering in some way, um, recognizing that, that everyone's in pain in some way. And that's actually a really overwhelming and kind of scary feeling to have, which I think contradicts with the, the more popular sort of naive conception of, of Buddhism as, oh, you know, like the Dalai Lama is so happy because he has compassion for everybody. <laughs> yeah. And like, that's kind of at odds with what Gorampa is saying, you know, imagining everybody's, you know, on fire and dying. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's really overwhelming. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's hard. That's a, a I'm, I'm nowhere close to understanding that, you know, to having that level of compassion for people. Yeah. But I think, uh, you know, one of the things that has really helped me from my, my studies of Buddhist philosophy has, has been to help me kind of take a step back and recognize that, okay, I'm angry about a situation, but this person over here is also angry. 
for their own reasons. And, and they have their own reasons for, you know, if we think about politics, right? Um, this person over here has their own reasons for seeing the world in the ways that they do and for thinking that injustice is happening in these certain ways. Well, I think injustice is happening in these other very certain ways. Yeah. You know, um, I love the fact that you are so committed to, to, to spreading these ideas around the world, like through sacred rights, through public scholarship, through tricycle, through lion's roar. But I came across something else that you did, which is an amazing looking project through great courses where you did like an audio lecture series on audible, which is essentially like, it's, it it looks like it feels like an audio book, right? So I'm really interested in like the foundation of this idea, like about your great courses series, how you planned it, what your prep was like, and maybe an overview of what people will experience if they take the course after hearing our conversation. Yeah. Um, this, this was a really fun project that I was really excited to, to work on that kind of mixes my, my academic interests with these interests in talking to a broader audience. Yeah. Um, the great courses, they actually reached out to me and asked if I would be willing to teach this course on, and they wanted it specifically to be on what are some life lessons that can be learned? What are some ways that um, different Asian religious traditions can be applied more universally outside of a specifically religious context. And so I had to work closely with Audible. Audible had to kind of give the okay on everything that I was that I was saying, but they actually gave me a lot of freedom, which was really fun to pick and choose the topics that I wanted to talk about. Yeah. So the the and it is, it's kind of an audiobook. It feels like an audiobook. And it's 10 30 minute lectures, give or take. And I cover one specific idea from one specific religious tradition in each lecture. So it's not like a survey of Asian religions, um, but I, I have one lecture that's on patience and the way that Shanti Deva talks about patience. Mm -hmm. I have one lecture that's on um, the Bhagavad Gita and how the ideas in the Bhagavad Gita are relevant to our lives. I have one, um, you had mentioned Taoism and Confucianism. I have lectures on those. I have one on Sikhism and the importance of um, service, the, the, the Sikh idea of selfless service. So um, it's it, it was really, really fun to record and to just work with the editors at Audible to and 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 the great courses to to help me craft these lectures in mm -hmm. ways that would be accessible to a wide audience. Um, and yeah, it was, it was, it was a really fun time. So that's so cool. I'm going to put a link to your audible course in the show notes. So if anybody out there is listening and that's you great. want to click in the show notes underneath the episode, you should be able to be taken directly to the audible course. Cause I thought that was so neat that I have to put a link to that inside the show <laughs> notes. Well, um, Connie, this has been such a fantastic and wide ranging conversation. So many life stories, academic stories, projects, public scholarship. And this is just such a thrill for me being able to talk to you about your work. And I hope it is for you as well. And I'm wondering if you can tell people where they can find you if they want to follow you and know more about what it is that you do. Yeah, thanks so much, Greg. This has been really great to to talk with you. Um, my website is one place where folks can find out what I'm doing. It's constancecasser.net. Mm -hmm. And on Twitter, you can follow me at Constance Casser. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. This has been such a treat. Thanks so much, Greg. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Stryvig. Support for this episode of Classical Ideas was provided by Sacred Rights, a Henry Luce Foundation project. Explore the work of Sacred Rights at sacred-rights.org.